Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Welcome everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, today we will have uh, this agenda here. Um, welcome to Navigating Decentralized Insurance. Today, um, we'll start with opening remarks here. We'll follow up with a venture's presentation around technology in the area and some trends that they're seeing as well. Um, and then we will have startup presentations as well from Insuro, Names, and Attestive. And then we'll follow up with some closing remarks. So um, I know you guys are all pros by this point, um, but some quick housekeeping. Please submit questions uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your window following the startup presentations, and then use the chat feature for general questions or comments. Um, please also remain muted unless you are presenting so we can keep clean audio going through. Okay, so the Avengers presentation coming up will feature our analysts, uh, Rafael, Blanca, and Andres. They have been researching the areas of decentralized. Um, so please enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome. First of all, I wanted to thank you all for being here and showing interest in the topic of decentralized insurance. Rafael Saif, Blanca Rivas Pombo, and myself, Andres Diaz Martinez, are very interested in this topic. And as such, we have put together uh, a set of slides to share with you and hopefully understand it a little bit better. Okay, so today uh, we're going to present uh, different trends within the decentralized insurance. And as decentralized finance uh, keeps expanding, so the new methods to protect uh, crypto assets, hedge against volatility, and secure yourself against cyber attacks. In this arena, new models are replacing uh, traditional carriers by communities that freely decide uh, to insure themselves. Perfect. So first, um, before we jump into too much detail, we wanted to understand the gears behind all of this, which in the end is blockchain. And what is blockchain? Blockchain can be simplified as a decentralized open database. Blockchains are structures where control is managed through multiple entities, hence decentralized. But we will touch upon this uh, later. But think of uh, blockchains as managed by a group of competing individuals instead of a central entity. Everyone can get access to it, hence they're open. And the purpose of a blockchain is to store uh, information electronically. And I want to stop this, or I want to stop here for a second, because it is important to understand that it can not only store uh, transactional data, but it can also run code in the form of smart contracts. So at a high level um, of what a blockchain is, we wanted to point out that blockchains are built on different layers. However, I won't go in, into too much detail on this slide so as not to make it complicated. But different projects such as Ethereum or Solana, where uh, they are created uh, on the first layer, their main purpose is to run a large volume of uh, smart contracts. Over this layer is where the creation of the businesses of the future um, will happen. And on top of these layers is where we will see the creation of all of these new projects that leverage the technology of these layer ones for multiple uh, different applications. We have already touched upon some basic building blocks of the blockchain, but we wanted to at least explain uh, two of them in order to better understand future slides. We talked about smart contracts, which in reality are not smart per se, but are just a standardized set of rules uh, for stakeholders to interact with each other. And we also wanted to highlight the term Oracle, which is the source of information that a smart contract would look at to determine if the terms of the contracts are met or not. Now, how does all of this uh, interact with each other and how does this work? Again, at a high level, how a blockchain works or at least like in general with some tricks and differences between blockchains is by, by validating transactions. Of course, this process starts, starts with a transaction placed by an individual on the chain. That transaction is sent to a peer-to-peer -peer network composed of multiple nodes. Um, and if these nodes agree that your transaction is valid, then that transaction gets validated and a new block is created. 
um, after the creation, the creation of the block, uh, it gets added uh, to the history of the blockchain or a ledger for bootkeeping purposes. And as the blockchain grows, there is more confidence in the validity of uh, that transaction. Validators are what are known as uh, miners, and they get reward, rewarded um, in different tokens for participating in this validation process. Finally, these businesses are governed in many different ways. Um, depending on where the transaction are placed, they can be on-chain or off-chain, where on-chain means that the transaction is done directly on the public layer, which means that it's affecting the blockchain directly, and they have some associated costs to them. And off-chain uh, transactions means that they are done on the blockchain, but not affecting the public ledger directly. So they are outside of it, uh, which means that they can be done either through a voucher or, or a contract. And depending if uh, on who is responsible um, in the on the blockchain, as we mentioned, it can be centralized or decentralized. However, it is not a dichotomy where one has to be chosen uh, between the other or uh, against the other. Uh, it is more of a sliding scale where different degrees of decentralization can happen. Thank you very much, Andres. So one of the leading types of businesses being built on the first layer right now are the financial institutions of the future, right? DeFi. Now, uh, this happens with the rise of on-chain financial activity like, you know, lending, borrowing, derivatives, speculation, and so on. So here's the role of, you know, here's where the role of decentralized insurance comes to play. Now, the first thing that we have to do is make a difference between decentralized insurance and DeFi insurance. So for us, decentralized insurance is the allocation of risk between a group of individuals, while DeFi insurance is the protection of your DeFi assets. Now, overall, a decentralized autonomous, a decentralized autonomous organization are, is created, right? Which means an open, an open platform where everybody can decide which protocols they want to insure. They do so by locking capital into liquidity pools. Now, members will become coverage providers, and if a claim is filed and accepted, it will be covered by the liquidity pool. Now, as a high level, how claims are verified, it's two steps. So the claims are verified by the community. So every coverage provider has the right to vote if a claim must be accepted. And claims can, and also claims can be verified automatically by using oracles. Now, what are the benefits of this particular model? First of all, the short reduction of overhead costs. In traditional insurance, around 35% of, uh, of the cost of premiums are spent in carriers' expenses. There's a faster, cl uh, faster claim settling process. There's more transparency, right? So at the end, you know, coverage providers have access to the information of the smart contract they want to cover. There, and of course, and the most important thing, you have protection against volatility and cyber attacks. Now, what are the risks of this of this model? There's a lack of correlation with the index payout, which is a basic problem of permanent insurance. There's a lack of scalability. At the end, in DeFi, in, in a DeFi hat network congestion can lead to failed transactions and of course exorbitant fees. There's a lack of underlying risk management. At the end, claims assessment can be handled in a gross manner with a yes or no adjustment only, you know, without quantifying the evaluation of the loss. And there's capital inefficiency. In many cases, coverage providers will receive unstable investment returns, something you don't expect out of the traditional insurance industry. Now, now we're going to talk about the, the five different models that we can find in decentralized insurance. So the first model is automated insurance. So programs that will automatically check if the protocol's code has been altered. So these programs could form the foundation for payouts on insurance market. And these models are advantage given that payouts are automatic. The second model will be trans-based insurance. So DeFi yields can be significant, and most users would rapidly trade a portion of their yield in return of some measure of protection. Then you have traditional insurance. Traditional insurance companies are underwriting specific crypto companies of wallets, and someday will begin to underwrite DeFi contracts. The next one will be prediction slash futures. So short selling offers a way to hedge the price of tokens through an open market. So both op options and prediction markets are not targeting, targeting insurance as a use case. Uh, at the end, making these options more inefficient than, uh, than pure insurance plays. Um, the last one will be hybrid insurance. So hybrid insurance offers traditional insurance correct contracts with explicitly defined coverage terms for DeFi protocols. And then claims, uh, claims validity is determined by the mutual member um, by mutual members, and they and uh, they use a pooled capital model for up to like around ten times capital efficiency. Now, here we wanted to demonstrate some examples of existing decentralized and defined insurance models. However, we will only focus on hybrid in, on, the, on the hybrid insurance model, which is at the end the one the the most the most interesting one in our opinion. Now, to do so, we will talk about two use cases that are clearly set in this example. The first use case is the case of Nexus Mutual. So Nexus Mutual is a decentralized autonomous organization that is fully owned by its members. It's registered in the UK as a warranty business, which is a designation basically used only by non-profit organizations. The idea is that members have the possibility to buy Nexus Mutual tokens and become coverage providers of the smart contract they decide, again, gaining an interest over time. 
Of course, those funds are then placed in a liquidity fund that would be then used to pay out claims. Now, the reason that we, why we wanted to to, sell, to you know to talk about Nexus Mutual is for three relevant uh, three relevant elements, right? So the first one is that they started to offer protection for funds deposited in centralized finance services. The second one is that uh, with other players like InsureDefy, they began to extend uh, smart contract insurance, which in the end it kind of resembles sure insurance. And, and last but not least, uh, they are extending their services to flood and earthquake insurance. So Nexus Mutual triggers a very important debate, which is aren't establishing the foundation for a new kind of insurance industry? So could this model be extended to other kind of insurance products? Now, the next case that we're going to talk about is the Lemonade Foundation. Now, the challenge that the Lemonade Foundation is tackling is that in Africa alone, there are around 300 million uh, smallholder farmers, and the majority of whom are financially protected against crippling climate risks. At the end, farmers are especially vulnerable um, to these particular elements because they don't have access to irrigation technology and rely on rainfall for their crops, making, at the end, the basis of their livelihood uh, incredibly precarious, no? So, for insurance companies that rely on, on traditional tools for distribution, pricing, claims handling, you know, protecting these farmers from devastating climate events, it's often, you know, it's often isn't financially viable at the end, right? So what's the solution that Lemonade is, uh, is, um, is uh, carrying away? So they have created a decentralized autonomous organization dedicated to building and distributing insurance at cost based on eco-friendly and proof, stake, uh, proof of stake blockchain. So Lemonade's technology will allow farmers to make and receive payments from their phones using global stable coins or local currencies. Now, the Lemonade Crypto uh, Climate Coalition will focus on innovating on, the, on these three following areas, let's say. So they want to accurately quantify weather risk, they want to better automate the claim assessment, and they want to improve funding under insurance. Now, the last two use cases that we want to mention are parametric insurance and annuities. So parametric insurance lends itself well to blockchain-based smart contracts and opens possibilities for decentralized insurance platforms. So these insurance products use data sources and algorithms for underwriting and payout decisions, making them ideal for demonstrating the benefits of decentralized insurance. So when certain conditions are met, let's say, I don't know, like a flight delay or extreme weather event, you know, you have a self-executing piece of software the, or the code that will kick in. And of course, based on that uh, piece of code, the claim will be then automatically verified and paid. Now, the last use case will be annuities, and we'll talk about annuities based on Federal Life. So Federal Life has introduced a private placement variable annuity that will let owners link some of the account value to Bitcoin assets, Ether assets, and other cryptocurrency assets. Now, they said it, would, um, it will offer the annuity only to accredited investors who can tolerate big account value ups and downs and the risk of loss of principal. Now, this particular this particular event uh, you know triggers a very important event right because at the end they're starting a new model and and this debate will come around to you know will will, will more insurance companies start placing variable annuities into crypto assets uh, you know will crypto investments gain more space into you know annuities account um, and something that we have to bear in mind is that if this happens we must look out for solutions that can help insurance companies of course to to mitigate risk in in their crypto investments Thank you very much. And now we are going to look at the VC and startup market within DeFi insurance space to better understand where it stands and where we are. <coughs> so here we have the market map where we have highlighted the following notable projects within the insurance space. We have classified them in ecosystems, DAOs, aggregators, oracles, decentralized insurance, and above all, DeFi insurance, previously explained by my colleagues. Here, uh, we have a slide explaining the DeFi VC deal activity. In 2021, investors put uh, 1.9 billion across 278 deals into DeFi companies, which is more capital than all previous years combined. We have tracked token deals that include venture funds, but please note that the token deals are not included here as they are often anonymous, suggesting that the actual amount of capital being raised is likely to be larger. DeFi developers have also become more comfortable raising outside capital, uh, with the medium time for a first time DeFi VC fundraise decreasing to around nine months in last year from uh, 15 months in 2019. We believe that the volume of velocity of capital flowing into DeFi has reached an inflection point and that increased institutional acceptance could accelerate investment. The top three global uh, DeFi deals are made, made last year were um, BlockFi, Dapper Labs, and Consensus. And the top three the um, DeFi uh, venture capital investors are AU21 Capital, Genesis Block Ventures, and NGC Ventures. <coughs> then, what is happening in the world? 
uh, since the inception of cryptocurrency, cybersecurity hack has been one of the biggest challenges and threats to the industry. There are quite a few famous and shocking attacks that have caused more than 500 million loss uh, since 2011, which have been shaking the foundation of crypto world. Thus, with the advent of DeFi, the cybersecurity issues come along. Needless to say, these cyber attacks have been posing significant threats to the whole DeFi ecosystem fundamentally. Besides the technical approaches to resolving this problem, um, insurance by its nature has been another effective means to manage this risk. However, by taking a deeper look at the current DeFi landscape, insurance products still remain scarce. According to the data from DeFi polls, uh, there are only three notable insurance protocols available out of 100 major DeFi projects that have been selected, such as Nexus Mutual, Opin, and Ewer. One common metric used for DeFi is the total value log. Uh, we will uh, state this as TDL from now on, which measures the amount of crypto committed to DeFi smart contracts. Users log in crypto to staking, staking uh, to conduct financial services or to interact with a DeFi product. <coughs> Nevertheless, the overall, the overall uh, total uh, value log being covered is extremely low by existing insurance projects. According to the data disclosed by Nexus Mutual, the total value cover of it, it was around 65 uh, million at its peak, which occupies more or 0.6% of all the assets across the landscape. And on the other hand, the cyber risk has also been growing continuously, and the market is calling for more insurance product to safeguard the whole ecosystem. <coughs> Then uh, regarding the market size, uh, while DeFi has uh, seen explosive growth within the past 18 months, the market for specific DeFi apps is still a, a small fraction of the crypto market. And we view the TVL as a proxy for how much demand there is for DeFi services. In the past uh, year, TVL grew to 108 billion from 2 billion at peak at over 224 billion during the last month. Uh, the total market cap of the crypto peaked at over 2.4 trillion around the same time. And we forecast that the TVL could surpass 500 billion by 2026, with uh, derivative protocols likely looking at the most value. Um, when considering the transaction volume, we see that Ethereum, a network process over <coughs> 1.3 million transactions each year, um, sorry, each day uh, in 2021 and including remittances, uh, trading, lending, bor lending, borrowing, various, and various other types of transactions. This is a tiny number as compared to the 1 billion daily global credit card transactions and other, around other 5.5 billion uh, daily trading volume in NASCAR. Capturing 1% of the credit card transaction on the Ethereum chain, it is at least a multiple of eight of its current volume. Likewise, when analyzing the protocol revenue, we can see that the annualized protocol revenue in all DeFi protocols is estimated at 5 billion. This again is a fraction against the 2.3 trillion global retail banking revenue, 2 trillion global cross-border payment revenue, and 35 billion global stock exchange revenue. The traditional finance industry is so lucrative that seizing a 1% market share means that a multiple of 10 of the DeFi, of the DeFi revenue. <coughs> and finally, we are going to talk about where are we going with all of this. Although the industry's North Star is, fully, um, is a fully decentralized financial system, we believe uh, DeFi will increasingly become interconnected with centralized finance. Similar to how Bitcoin was launched as a decentralized payments network, it has become highly integrated with decentralized finance services such as payments, for example, PayPal, exchanges such as Coinbase, and custodians such as Fidelity. To that end, we expect DeFi on and off ramps to proliferate in the coming years to enable centralized finance participation. Uh, traditional finance institutions such as Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, JP Morgan, amongst others, will also likely to continue to explore and develop DeFi custodial capabilities as smart contracts platforms continue to crop up. Interoperability uh, <coughs> among the various platforms will be vital to growing the DeFi space. This will occur by enabling front-end wallet applications to exchange tokens, as well as by building back-end infrastructure, such as cross-chain bridges that allow tokens to move seamlessly across blockchain platforms. Multi-chain capabilities are likely to become the next uh, progression for DeFi wallets and dashboards. Moreover, a great example of collaboration between a financial institution and a startup focus in DeFi is the case of Aon and Names. Uh, Names is a smart contract platform for the placement, trade, reporting, a settlement of insurance risk, and they are working on its first pilot, with, which will allow Aon to create a platform for digital asset companies to scale up their cover efficiently 
and cost effectively as the as the market continues uh, to expand. And now we wanted to explain some key learnings uh, from this project, and this is one of the most exciting parts of this presentation. So it is unquestionable that DeFi insurance continues to develop and needs improvement, and projects continue to emerge and gradually uh, from traditional insurance, they are put uh, on chain to risk fully covered in the crypto industry. As the price uh, fading of oracles matures and the demand of uh, for insurance from all parties increase, DeFi insurance projects have begun to seek more efficient and personalized solutions. In the future, the continuous uh, enrichment of insurance products types and the improvement of capital efficiency of the insurance market are inevitable, inevitable trends. With the improvements of other public chains and the increase of asset volume, uh, the growth of risk protection and demand uh, promotes the development of DeFi insurance projects on each chain. Most of the existing projects that uh, provide traditional insurance product do not serve as insurance providers and only provide insurance sales platform. Therefore, cooperation with traditional insurance companies uh, is particularly important. After looking at the decentralized insurance, it is, uh, and it's a stage, sorry, uh, we wanted to suggest a few things to look at when scouting this industry. One of the reasons why we should be conscious uh, of this industry is that, as we have seen with the development and adoption of the DeFi industry, we are one step away from mass market adoption, like a big hack, uh, continued inflation of fiat currencies, uh, regulatory changes, and so on. Moreover, new solutions that are reducing the learning curve uh, to enter the DeFi uh, industry are also appearing. Therefore, an early bet on key players could be extremely rewarding. As you can observe on the screen, there is still uh, lots of components that need to be further developed, but there are many interesting solutions uh, popping up that are targeting these deficiencies. Lastly, we wanted to show our considerations for the short-term and long-term uh, gaps that need to be addressed. Some examples here are uh, in the short-term development, the development of decentralized infrastructure. It is clear how this technology has the potential to disrupt the market. However, there is still uh, a lot of room for further development. Transaction processing needs to mature and needs to become faster and cheaper, which is a big topic on blockchain ecosystems. And there are uh, strong contenders for more efficient solutions to mitigate this problem, like for example, Polygon. With the introduction of new data sources, processes can be more easily automated with the creation of new, more reliable oracles, and policy creation and premium calculation will be more adjusted. Also, the development of DAOs will lead uh, to the need of their own tooling solutions. Blockchain identification systems uh, need to be established to ensure transaction uh, security and some regulatory changes are to be expected that will affect the entire landscape. The first main change will come with the adoption of cryptocurrencies as a generalized accepted payment method. Here, regulatory uh, authorities like the FATF and regulations like the 4AMLD um, will be key to follow. Other major changes will be uh, to the governance of the organizations themselves. While decentralized, there needs to be an entity that takes responsibility. As such, it is ex expected that, regulator, that regulators uh, will look at three main things. The distribution of governance tokens, the individuals who own the majority of those tokens, or they either regulate a set of standards for the code that runs uh, the organization. Any startup that eases this regulatory compliance will easily grow in this industry. Finally, in the long-term vision, we recommend to keep an eye out for those disruptive models that have not yet been created. With the uh, cr increased creative uses of DAOs, uh, further application of artificial intelligence and machine learning for process automation, interoperability across multiple chains and layers, as well as tools that will enlarge uh, large organizations uh, to utilize this new technology, such as Avalanche, for example. So this is our um, take on what decentralized insurance is, which we believe is very exciting. And of course, we would like to thank you all again for listening in. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the emails that you see on the screen. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, Blanca, and Rafael. Um, apologies for the audio and visual issues. It looks like there are some, some technical issues on the display there. Um, if anyone would like to follow up with the slide deck presented there so they go through it on their own time, please do reach out to me. You can just send me a direct message here on Zoom, or you can also message Gina with the PNPTC brackets, um, and we will be happy to send that along to you. Okay, so moving on, we have our startup presentations and names, Insuro and Attesti. As a reminder, 
I start as well, five minutes to pitch and then two minutes of Q&A following. And then if you'd like to chat and further discuss with the startups, uh, please just answer the poll after the presentation. And first up, we have Names. Names is building the world's leading fully regulated marketplace for on-chain insurance. I'll hand it off. Cool. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much to the uh, plug and play guys for this opportunity. Uh, I'll take you through the names story, a little bit about what, what we're currently working on and, and where we're going. Um, uh, as you guys mentioned, uh, you know, our key uh, goal is to create the world's leading fully regulated marketplace for on-chain insurance. Uh, obviously, the on-chain bit is, uh, is pretty important. Uh, our main uh, challenge and focus over the last uh, two and a bit years has really been how do we integrate legal and regulatory processes into this technology without uh, hampering it. Uh, so, you know, the problem that we're going after is that insurance is very old. Uh, you know, the marketplace uh, is very manual, um, human driven, uh, and very fragmented as a result. Um, lots of PDFs uh, and emails being sent around. Um, and, uh, you know, this new technology really provides the opportunity for a new type of infrastructure to facilitate uh, contract placements, uh, facilitate the raising of capital, uh, and for the creation of uh, new and short techs uh, on chain. Uh, so what we're saying is that we can replace bank accounts, lots of administration, lots of legal processes with uh, a single smart contract. Uh, the smart contract acts as a balance sheet uh, operated by what we call a sponsor, which would most likely be an insurance company. Uh, this sponsor uh, can raise capital uh, into their balance sheet, um, and that capital is tokenized. So not only is the smart contract replacing your bank account, your trustee, uh, and all the administration processes around that, um, but the tokenization of capital in the balance sheet um, is a representation and proof of ownership over that capital for different investors. So capital markets can have um, not only a, you know, this proof of ownership over a particular insurance program uh, where they're getting exposure to different risks of that particular balance sheet, um, but they can trade uh, that ownership um, and all the legal and regulatory uh, responsibilities of that ownership uh, as easily as trading a cryptocurrency. Um, you know, we started off, uh, as discussed throughout the presentation so far, um, the, the plug and play presentation, um, we started off really with this, uh, you know, aim of allowing assets to match liabilities when, um, uh, when underwriting a digital asset risk, uh, the space when we started out was 150 uh, billion in, in market cap. Uh, and obviously peaked last year at three trillion. And our, our original hypothesis was if the space continued to grow, then insurance capacity wouldn't keep up um, or insurance capacity couldn't scale. So our original go-to-market, uh, which we're focused on, is providing the environment for insurers and brokers to build insurance programs where um, assets match liabilities. A balance sheet can be denominated in Bitcoin, covering Bitcoin risks, Ether, covering Ether risks. Um, but there's no reason why through use of a stable coin, which is a cryptocurrency pegged to the dollar, uh, we can't build balance sheets denominated in dollars to facilitate the underwriting of uh, you know, traditional uh, dollar risks. And so really, you know, we're looking to move mid to long term into providing the infrastructure for um, placements in catastrophe, uh, travel and health, uh, you name it. Um, you know, we've taken what we think is a relatively novel approach on the regulatory side. Uh, we were sort of very pro-regulation from the beginning. Um, we have a digital asset license, which is called a Class M um, in Bermuda, as well as a uh, IGB, uh, which is an insurance license out of Bermuda. Uh, and that's under the structure of what's called a segregated accounts company. Um, and what this means uh, is we are able to allow insurers uh, to operate under our licensing, uh, which allows them not only to not 
be based in Bermuda. Uh, they can be based all over. These are insurance companies that will be running these on-chain balance sheets. Uh, but it also means that uh, they don't have to have a digital asset license themselves, uh, which not many companies do. Um, the segregated accounts company structure um, therefore puts the licenses that we've worked uh, for a very long time to uh, obtain uh, into the hands of uh, a competitive market. Uh, and for them to be able to utilize these in a, you know, a few weeks onboarding process instead of obtaining them themselves. Um, our class M and IGB are technically uh, sandbox licenses and we're a couple of weeks uh, or a couple of days, I've been saying that for a while, uh, away from graduating to the full versions of both of these licenses. Um, as well as the tokenization of capital within balance sheets, which we call participation tokens, um, we have our own token as well, uh, planned for September this year. Uh, this achieves three, or this plays uh, three functions. Uh, the first is we're looking to launch a discretionary fund. Uh, the name's discretionary fund, it's wrong on the slide, uh, to act as a market backstop. Uh, that uh, discretionary fund has a particular dynamic uh, whereby um, it can distribute uh, surplus to capital providers in a sustainable fashion. So if those on the uh, on the call uh, are um, aware of the term mercenary liquidity uh, with network rewards, with these sort of protocols, uh, we've created this, uh, this design of a discretionary fund to sustainably uh, reward capital providers on our system through distribution of a surplus, which is that third bullet point. Um, there's also staking rewards to incentivize all parties, and that's a very powerful um, uh, you know, concept of aligning supply and demand side incentives. Um, growing team, uh, we're at 15, we'll be 29 by the end of this year, 58 by the end of next year is the plan. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to Plug and Play and for everyone else for listening. Appreciate it. Great piece of text. So if you'd like to meet with Dan and names, please just respond to the poll that you see up on the screen now. Give you a second. Okay. And Dan, um, we have a couple questions here that I've received. Um, first one being, what is the role of regulation in decentralized insurance broadly, I guess? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, I, our take was that I'm not sure where regulation is at in uh, regulating decentralized insurance in the purest form of uh, the term decentralization. But I know that it's very valuable and possible to regulate the fringes of decentralized protocols and that includes insurance. Um, so yeah, our take was that we sit on the fringes of decentralization. We're not strictly uh, decentralized as a, as a regulated entity. Um, but what our licensing allows us to do is you know, really connect to the traditional insurance industry. Um, and so you know, I think the short answer is it plays a big role. Uh, it's very important. It's a very heavily re regulated uh, space. Um, and is certainly something we've found to be vital uh, for uh, the insurance uh, companies, carriers, brokers, MGAs, et cetera, that we work with. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see. I know there's a few projects taking similar approaches on the regulatory side, which is great to see. Um, and yeah. we'll see how it develops over time. Uh, and you know, what's often, what's unique about insurance and regulation and digital assets is that Bermuda is a jurisdiction is very strong in reinsurance in particular uh, and they have a you know great framework out there that they've been developing during our uh, sandbox and previously so um yeah i think not only does it regulate some of the interesting necessary parts of the these initial designs but it also has a framework for issuing tokens and you know doing these other uh, pieces that uh, are necessary for most of the protocols and and the landscape that we see so yeah um, okay yeah, more to come there well, I appreciate the thoughtful answer. And then Dan, um, I guess for everyone else, if you would like to connect with them afterwards, please just make sure you've responded to the poll. Um, and if you missed that, just reach out to myself or Gina 
and we'll put you in contact. And Dan, thank you very much. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Next up, we have Insuro. Insuro is a decentralized capital provider for insurance risk. And I believe I'll be handing it off to Marco here. Yeah, Insuro is a, is a decentralized capital provider for insurance risk and more specifically for, for MGAs or, or parametric MGAs. What we're seeing in the, in, the, in the space is that the numbers of MGAs worldwide is, uh, is growing uh, exponentially. And currently we are looking at uh, alternative for source of capacity rather than the traditional insurance capacity. So we're seeing that uh, capital markets are jumping in. We're seeing that uh, MGAs are, are now uh, becoming full carriers in order to become more and more independent from, uh, from traditional insurance carrier. But today I will focus on, uh, on, on a new asset class that is being created. So the one of uh, decentralized finance in also called DeFi. So in this space, we have around $150 billion of uh, total stablecoin supply. As Dan mentioned, a, a stablecoin is a, is a cryptocurrency that is pegged uh, one-to-one -one with the value of the US dollars or, or other assets. And this uh, $150 billion is led by mainly two companies, USDT or Tether, and more and more uh, USDC. That is a, is a regulated entity in Bermuda as well. So we have in the space 4 million DeFi users and $90 billion of total value locks in this uh, DeFi protocol, starting from zero a uh, couple of, the, uh, of years ago. So we're seeing an exponential growth of, of this space, given to the fact that it's uh, uh, bringing innovation and, uh, and optimization of the traditional like, processes in the, in the financial world. So, and the democratization of, uh, of investments. So what is the insurer is doing is essentially bridging this capital from the DeFi space uh, with the need of alternative capital coming from uh, risk model providers and MGAs on the other side. So we're trying to fill this gap. And the way that works is that liquidity providers that they can either be uh, retail or institutional investors invest uh, USDC, so stable coin, in a, inside an insurer liquidity pool that is governed by the uh, Polygon's blockchain. So Polygon is a, is a permissionless blockchain. What that means is that uh, it's accessible by everyone in the world and it's transparent and immutable. So this capital then collected inside the insurer liquidity pool is then used to provide insurance capacity to, to MGAs. They sell a product uh, receiving a premium in, uh, in USD or in fiat or, uh, or crypto, convert this to USDC and send it to an insurer liquidity pool. And the insurer liquidity pool automatically locks a certain portion of the capital in order to guarantee solvency. So essentially acting as, a, as an insurance. In case of an uh, event, we automatically trigger the, the policy using uh, something called oracles that fetch the information from outside and trigger the smart contract that automatically release funds to the policyholders, cutting a lot of the inefficiency in the insurance uh, processes and insurance value chain. Now, since we're based on top of a permissionless blockchain and using a USDC as a currency, we then can take the asset that we have and invest it into the different DeFi protocols that are present. In specific, we are investing the protocol inside Aave, which is a decentralized lending protocol. So with over $21 billion under management. Aave, it's interesting because it's almost risk-free. So the loans there are over collateralized. It's liquid, so you can jump in and out your position. And accrual as interest rate, uh, that is around three to 5%. This on one side allow us to be more competitive on the insurance capacity that we provide to our partners. And on the other side, uh, give to the liquidity providers uh, interest rate that come from Aave on top of the insurance returns. So we are currently uh, regulated in uh, Bermuda as well. So we, we have a, a sandbox license as the one that like call uh, insurance general business license. And the other license that we have is a digital, digital asset business license plus T. So T stands for testing. And we're part of the Bermuda regulatory framework, sandbox framework. So in terms of the way we work, we allow the MGAs to set their own uh, premium. And essentially the city commission are taken up front out of the net premium. So the premium minor, the city commission, we take an insurer share for running the platform and the cost of capital gets back to the liquidity providers. So you can see us as a, a double side marketplace where LPs deposit capital on one side 
and MGAs uh, seek capital for risk and LPs gets rewarded for, for providing that. In terms of the team, we're a team of five uh, in the management. So with different type of skills. So I come from a blockchain background and a venture capital background. Our CTO has over 25 years of experience. Our quant, uh, Luca and Jago have experience being um, mathematicians and physicians and uh, working in the risk for one of the biggest banks in the, in the Netherlands. And Colin has uh, over 30 years of experience in, uh, in insurance and reinsurance. He was a CFO for Markel, Latin America. So happy to take uh, any question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marco, very much. And I'll give everyone a moment to answer the poll on screen if you'd like to connect. Uh, in the meantime, please enter any questions in the Q&A box. Um, Dan, from names previously, I'd like to point out also that you got a question in the Q&A from Craig as well. So if you'd like to address that, um, there. Sure, okay. yeah, just typing it up. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and it looks like, Marco, we have one question for you here. Um, what about LP return? Does it change dynamically? Yes, so the way that works is that for the, uh, in order to cover for the unexpected losses, the protocol automatically locks a certain portion of the capital uh, for solvency. And this capital receives uh, uh, an interest rate based on the duration of, of the policy. So, and currently sits at 10%. Uh, and this 10% gets some to the average return. So we're talking about 12 to 13%. And it can be changed based on the complexity of the product and the, uh, how risky the product is. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's variable. Okay, and then one more from Craig. Uh, where does underwriting and actuarial functions sit? Yeah, so at the moment we have, uh, uh, so the underwriting of the, profit of the product is done by our MGA partners. We have a, a quant team and uh, actuary in our team that rechecks the risk uh, uh, model that, was, that is created by, by the MGAs and makes sure it is well calibrated. So we have a parameter in the smart contract that is called margin of conservatives that essentially allow us to increase the, the pricing and protects for more expected losses. And what is important here is that we have a real-time visibility of the risk. So given the parametric products and the smart that we use, we have real-time view of the performance of, of the product. And now we are we're able to modify the pricing with a, with a, a immediate effect by changing the MOC. Okay, thank you, Marco. And it looks like you have a couple more questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna let you address those in text though, as we are running out of time when you get to this last presentation. Um, so thank feel you. free, yep, thank you. Feel free to address those in the text box. Coming up, we have a test Eve. Uh, test Eve verifies the authenticity of photos, videos, documents, and data, helping businesses build efficient processes through automation, improve customer experience, and provide increased protection for information exchange. So I will pass it off now. Hi, my name is Nikos Vekuridis. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Attestive, and we are on a mission to put authenticity into all digital media. This includes digital photos, videos, and documents. Now, why is this important to insurance? Well, the insurance industry has over 40 billion in fraud in property and casualty in the US alone. Insurance is embracing automation and self-service with over 70% of claims expected to be touchless by 2025. At the same time, new tools have emerged for altering or editing digital media. When we polled businesses, 82% of businesses were concerned about fake digital media, but only 29% were doing something about it. So with a testive, we're providing a solution that helps businesses deal with the problem of fake digital media. Essentially, we build trust and reduce risk with validated digital photos, and we do it via blockchain tamper-proofing and AI analysis. And what it enables is the convenience and savings of trusted self-service and straight through automation. And the operative word here is trusted, and we do it with a platform that's secure and interoperable with your existing systems. 
We use the blockchain or distributed ledger for tamper proofing and what it provides is a foundation for trusted self-service processes. And these processes can include quotes, claims and inspections and they can be across really any line of business. The benefit is authenticity and validation for touchless transactions. Think of transactions when there's no human intervention. A test of automates the validation and photos and protects against fraud. The reason we use distributed ledger is for cross organizational validation. There's just a number of stakeholders, including insureds, carriers, TPAs, appraisers, brokers, uh, even law enforcement. They can all validate each other's photos, regardless of the infrastructure that they use. Blockchain is very secure. It eliminates the outsider and insider threats. And it's far more difficult to alter with a consensus based model than a private database. And it provides the efficiencies of shared infrastructure where every stakeholder can participate, regardless of the infrastructure that they use. The way Attestive uses DLT is for our patented fingerprinting of digital media. That's for self-service photos, videos, or documents. In the future, we intend to use it for smart contracts, for payment automation, even tokenized credits. The benefits are many in terms of security, privacy, fraud reduction. We store no personally identifiable information on the blockchain. And what we do is we enable this trusted automation, the straight through processing, or even efficiencies for funds transfers. Looking at some of our success stories, ACD is an auto claims TPA using Attestive where they built a premium fraud resilient service for auto claims. Harbor AI is one of our customers using us for commercial underwriting where they've used us to enable a self-service inspection that is 80% less than the cost of traditional inspection. Finally, uh, Attestive is very useful for high value personal property. Think Rolex watches, diamond rings, things like that, where we can verify the authenticity, the existence and the condition of these assets prior to underwriting. So overall, Attestive offers one of the most comprehensive media validation systems on the market. It's decentralized, it's blockchain based. We have a number of partners in insurance, including Guidewire and Cognizant. Feel free to visit our website to learn more, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you would answer the poll, if you'd like to meet. That'd be great. I'll give you a second to do that. In the meantime, please submit any questions you'd like answered as well. Uh, I believe we have someone live on the line from Attestive. Is that correct? Yes, I'm Paul Duran, Director of Business Development here at Attestive. Thank you very much, Paul. Let's see if we have any questions. I know I received one directly, but would like to answer any that were in the larger group here. Looks like not right now. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask one of these that has been sent in directly. Um, how does the blockchain help stop fraud? Well, first, I want to thank you for having us, Sean. I want to thank the plug and play team. Um, that's a good question. So what, what we do at Attestive is we fingerprint digital media, uh, basically taking advantage of the immutable, immutability uh, attributes of the blockchain. And when we fingerprint uh, digital media, you know, if you're doing a claim, you take a photo, we fingerprint it at the point of capture, which is basically a cryptographic representation of the image data and metadata. We take that fingerprint, put it on the blockchain, making it tamper proof. Tamper proof. So in the future, if anybody wants to validate that photo, they can verify that no changes have made, been made to that photo going forward. Excuse me, I'm on mute here. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, one more here. What are some of the benefits from using the blockchain in general? But... Well, what, what, what it enables, it enables essentially more than two parties to essentially trust the digital media. So if, if an insurer takes a picture, the adjuster can validate that photo. And then when the carrier is looking at that photo, they can also validate that photo. And if there's even a second carrier that's going under subrogation, they can also validate that photo. So essentially it builds trust with, with more, than, more than two parties with respect to the digital media. A second benefit is we can detect duplicates. A lot of fraud, you know, you get images submitted for essentially, um, you know, the same claim to multiple carriers. So we're able to essentially detect duplicates via the fingerprints, which contains no personally identifiable information that's on the blockchain. 
Okay, okay, that makes sense. It's great. And then last question here: Do insurers need to set up their own blockchain or consortium? The answer, the answer to that is, is no. Um, we basically are blockchain agnostic. Uh, we we are currently using uh, Algorand, which is an eco, a highly economical and and highly scalable block uh, blockchain. But essentially, we're agnostic. Um, we we can be essentially tied to any any consortium or public ledger. Okay. And there is one question here in the chat from Craig. What is the business model and where is the most traction to date? The business model is we charge per, per transaction. Um, the, the biggest traction that we've gotten is on the, on the claim side, as well as underwriting for personal property with a major carrier. Okay. All right. And with that, we have wrapped up. Paul, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Okay, thank you for tuning in, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the content here. If you, I saw everyone pop the email in the chat, but if you would not mind, please answer the poll on screen about the event. Always appreciate your feedback. Um, and for anything individual, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is on the screen there, s.volk at pnptc.com. I'm partner success manager here. And thank you all for joining.